Happy Sabbath, church. Oh, we can do better than that. Happy Sabbath, everyone. This is the day the Lord hath made. We will what? Rejoice and be glad in it. So grateful to be here with you. Um, both my wife and I, we were traveling to get down here to Houston, and she got in late, late, late last night and got up early, early, early this morning. So we are rambling and rushing to rejoice with the saints of God. Amen? <clears throat> but we are so glad to be here this time. Uh, I covet your prayers as we go into the Word of God. Again, I, I, it seems like every time I come, I have to come apologizing. I'm thankful for all of you who've come out so early on this morning, and I promise it won't always be like this. It won't always be like this, but I'm thankful that you're here. We are going to race right out and go to your sister church so that we can do this installation service there as well. And then things start to get more into a rhythm. I've had a chance to talk with leadership from both the churches, and it seems like you guys will have the first and third Sabbaths and the other church will have the second and fourth. And I'm excited because I heard that there is potluck involved. <laughs> praise God from whom all blessings flow. So praise the Lord. It seems like I will not be losing too much weight in this district. Praise God. <clears throat> it's time to get into the word of God. And if you allowed your Bibles to keep the Sabbath with you, I would challenge you to turn with me to the book of Joshua, chapter 14. Happy New Year, by the way. <clears throat> Joshua, chapter 14. We're going to read just for your hearing, for emphasis, verse 12. Joshua 14, verse 12. If you've found that, please Say amen. amen. And the Bible reads this way. <clears throat> now, give me this mountain that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Amalekites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Chemazite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kirath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Amalekites. Then the land had rest. Hmm. The title of this message for the time we have is Give Me This Mountain. Give Me This Mountain. Shall we talk to the Lord about it? Father God, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Speak, for your servants deserve to hear a word from you and not simply be left with me. May your Holy Spirit have full access to our hearts, our minds, our ears, and my mouth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. My, my brother-in-law, Molly's brother, Michael, for a long time in his life, he was an investor. But Michael invested not in the stock exchange that you would normally consider on Wall Street, nor in the NASDAQ stock exchange. Michael invested in something that I did not know existed until 
my brother-in-law introduced me. Michael invested in sneakers. I bet you didn't even know that was even a thing. All of those sneakers, those, those basketball shoes that have names attached to them, the only one that I was familiar with was Jordans. I, I, I knew about Jordans, and pretty much everybody knows about Jordans, but I, I didn't know that just about everybody has their own shoe. And I didn't know that there were people who bought the shoes not to wear, but to invest. And he began to show me that he has stacks and stacks and stacks of different shoes, and he'd buy them, but he'd never wear them. Like, what good is a shoe that you don't wear? And I'm not going to use this time to turn into whichever of you in the closet has shoes that you don't wear. That's not what the sermon is about. But he said, no, you, you invest them. You invest them. And them. The longer you have them, the more valuable they become. And you got to watch to find how the going market is. And when they're high, you sell. And when you find some that are low, you buy. And I'm watching him go online and do all of this. And I'm like, man, this is fascinating. I didn't know. He said, yes, there are a lot of people who make lots of money just Investing in shoes. So I asked him this question, and this kind of leads to where I wanted to go with this illustration. I said, how do, you, how do you get the shoes? He said, oh, that's the tricky part. So you can't just go to the store and pick them up. If you're going to really be an investor, you got to get there and get these sneakers because many of them are limited edition. You got to get there before anybody else does. For most of us, we don't understand what that would look like. So let me help you out. You guys know about Black Friday sales? I want you to imagine that it's not even Black Friday. And there has been word that has gone out that shoes are going to be sold. Maybe it's a limited edition Jordan or a Penny Hardaway. You have to be an old school basketball not to know that name. And in order to get it, you've got to get in line early, hours before the store is open. I want you to picture a line that is wrapped around the building of people. It's still dark out. They've been out for three hours before the store opens to get in line to get their hands on a limited edition pair of shoes. Now put on your running shoes in your mind and go with me to the tribe of Judah. It's early in the morning. This is a special morning. Israel has been at war <clears throat> trying to claim what God promised Canaan. They've been at war for a few years now, and overwhelmingly, things have been successful. Yes, there was that hiccup at Ai. But outside of that, things have gone well. This is the stories have been told of Joshua leading the children of Israel, and with a shout, the walls of Jericho have fallen. The, the stories have been told of this same Joshua chasing his enemies, and it's starting to become sundown. Maybe, maybe it was going into the Sabbath. I don't know. But Joshua said, we can't break the Sabbath and beat our enemies. So God, hold the sun up. And everybody's rejoicing, but on this day, on this day, it is not a day of battle. It is a day to claim inheritance. And all the leaders of all 12 of the tribes are getting in line. You can see it. It's not just one 
for every tribe. There's a cluster of them. They want to make sure things are done well. All of them have had a, a, a blueprint that has been given out by Moses ahead of time so that they have a general idea of what their tribe will inherit. But all of them have lined up. And in the front of the line is the oldest person in all of Israel. Next to Joshua himself. It's Caleb. Now, I don't know about you, but the older I get, the less I want to stand in line. I hate Christmas shopping because you frantically go get gifts and then you have to stand. In line. That's why there are so many of us older folks who are so glad. We praise God for Amazon.com. Because <laughs> nobody wants to be in line. And to get this 80 plus year old man to wake up hours early, make sure his wife has his stuff ironed and pressed. Caleb gets dressed, and before anyone else is in line, Judah is first in line to get the inheritance of Israel. See the line as it goes back. There's the cluster of the Judites, and, and then there's a cluster, maybe Naphtali comes next, or, or Benjamin, or, or somebody else. Further down the line, you can see all the tribes lined up. Caleb's eyes are resolute and determined. He's been waiting for this day for 43 years. 40 Three years. What is it that would drive a man this old to be up this early? He's got a 43 year old itch that he's got to scratch. The Bible says in verse 6, now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea about you and me. Then he does a little history. He says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now, let me help you understand. You're familiar with that story. This is the reason why the children of Israel had to wander 40 years. You remember, they came, they, they sent the spies in. And they took one from every tribe, and they went on in, and the tribe came back, and they gave an evil report. So let me step a little closer to you and let you know, they probably all didn't go together. They probably divided up in twos. So you two are going to the north, you two are going south, you two are going east and west, and all over. And more than likely, Joshua and Caleb were not together. So when Caleb says, the ones with me gave an evil report, he's talking about whatever spy it was that he was assigned to be next to. They both went to the same spot. And it's probably more than likely this is the spy who led out in telling everybody there are giants in the land. Because that's the spot where Caleb went. 
where there were giants. Obviously, we know there weren't giants all over Canaan. So you got this one spot in the report that everybody gets fixated on and it causes the fear that causes 40 years of wandering. And that was Caleb's prayer partner. See him as he's standing up in front and he's, 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 he's there waiting and he goes back and he looks at Joshua. Joshua knew he'd be there. Joshua knew Caleb was coming. Joshua saw it. They both have this twinkle in their eye that only the oldest people in the congregation understand. We've been through God not only opening up the Jordan River, we were there when he opened the Red Sea. Oh, don't lose sight of the old school Christians. Amen, light. They see some things and know some things. They've been a part of the journey and they have a valuable thing to contribute. You know what happened. You were there. You saw it, Joshua. You, you were a part of this whole thing. You heard what Moses said. I know what's on the paper. And I know that Judah is going to inherit this land that has the giants in it. And I came first in the group of my people and first in Israel to let you know you were there, you heard him. Moses said that the land that I walked on is mine to inherit. Can you imagine that conversation as it goes a lot closer? See, here's the thing that you need to understand. The route that the children of Israel took through the desert, it, it doesn't take 40 years to walk it. So the only way that the children of Israel could be walking this route is that they have to go in circles for 40 years. So like the earth rotating or, or, or revolving around the sun, there are times where you're far away from the sun and it gets winterish. And then there are times when you get close to the sun and it gets summerish, especially here in Texas. So you know, understand, for Caleb, that meant there were times where the children of Israel's wanderings took them far away from Canaan. And maybe he didn't think about it so much. Ah, but there are also times where their wandering took them in sight of where they failed last. Caleb remembers it. Caleb remembers what happened. How he pleaded with the people, let's trust God, but they wouldn't listen to him. And even though, listen to me, church family, even though they made mistakes, Caleb didn't transfer his membership. <laughs> Caleb didn't quit returning tithe and offerings. Amen, lights. He stuck with the people of God even when they were in error. This is a unique individual. He, he sticks with them. Matter of fact, he goes into the battle with them knowing that Moses and, and the Ark of the Covenant aren't going with them. I'm going to be there with my people. I'm going to be there. And every time they wander near the promised land, Caleb starts to look at that spot where they lost, 
where they had to run in retreat. If I ask you, and if you're real, you have those spots that you lost, that you didn't win, you didn't overcome, that you're stuck in. And every so often, we love Sabbaths when our minds and the experiences are far away from where we messed up. We love those days. But God is faithful, and he keeps bringing you back by the area you never seem to over. Uh, now I'm in this message. Now I can, I can see myself in this. Because it's 2024. And I dare you to ask, is this year simply going to be like last year? Where we rotate around. And our objective is to simply just make it. When there is an inheritance that God has promised, there is victory. Do you realize what God said to the children of Israel? He says to us, he told them, where you put your feet, it will belong to you. Where you step, it's yours. And that means you got to keep stepping. You got you, you to keep moving. We can't afford to stay in one place. If you're a pathfinder, you understand. God is calling you. He says, where you step, I'll give to you. Forward march. And you still at mark time? God says, move forward. And Caleb now has gone 40 years wandering through with the people of God, watching his friends and relatives all die out in the desert. So now you understand why he's first in line. In his sleep, Caleb sees the giants taunting him as he is forced to retreat with the rest of Israel. He's etched their faces in his brain. And now on this day, 80 plus years old, he says, give me the mountain. It's mine. I don't want anybody else to get in line ahead of me. I want this. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. See, let me help you understand something, church, the most high God. Many times we think that waiting for Jesus to come is what happens when you go to a restaurant and you wait on your food. And we keep waiting, put in our order, it'll be here, and the appetizer comes, so you know food's coming, but you're waiting. But when you go to the restaurant, nobody ever calls you the waiter. Do you know what the waiter in the restaurant is doing? He's serving. He's bringing the water. He's taking the order. He brings the bread, if it's Olive Garden. 
brings you the salad. He makes sure that there's cheese on it and no cheese for those of you who don't want the cheese. And, and he's going back and this water is tepid. Yes. And he goes back and he gets the ice water. Is this good for you? I think we want lemonade now. Yes. He's in movement and in service. The way that we wait on the inheritance does not involve sitting in one place. It involves moving forward. And God is calling us not to stand still, but to move forward. I hear you, but it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. You don't know what we've been through. You don't know what we've seen. Caleb does. Caleb understands. It's hard. But Caleb also understands this. Caleb understands the burning bush principle. You remember the Bible story of burning bush, right? Where Moses is walking also in a holding pattern. Also in the desert. Also for 40 years. And, and here's the part, uh, uh, maybe one of these days later on I'll preach that full sermon, but here's the part that, that I like. The Bible says it isn't that the day Moses saw the burning bush is the day the burning bush started burning. The word of God says when Moses saw it, giving the indication that if he had looked, it would have been there yesterday. Because the power of God is not sitting and waiting. The power of God is on display. It's just waiting for us to look. He understands the burning bush principle. Pastor Gray, what is the burning bush principle? Well, let's look at the burning bush. The bush is something that is perishable. Can I get an amen for that? The bush is something that is perishable, and it's nothing to see a bush. It's no big deal to see a bush out in the desert. Neither is it a big deal to see a bush on fire in the desert. It's hot. It's dry. Anybody ever seen? You know sometime this summer, California is going to have some hot, dry fires. We know it. It's going to happen. It's just the conditions. So it was nothing for the bush to be on fire. That wouldn't attract Moses. What attracted Moses to the bush is that a perishable thing was on fire and would not burn up. You see, Caleb and Joshua understood when something that is perishable, is inhabited by God who's imperishable, miracles start to take place. Caleb understood that yes, I can stumble, I can fall, I can be in a difficult spot in my life, but that doesn't mean what conquered me yesterday is gonna conquer me today. Caleb understood what I need in order to accomplish what I failed at before is not try harder. What I need is more of the spirit of God because with God, all things. Say it again, church. With God, how much? All things are possible. So Caleb comes early in the morning recognizing he's got to stand up. Now here's the thing, lest you think Caleb has got this big ego. I can't go out with failure on my record. I'm going to have to go and beat those giants that beat me, and then we're even and square, and, and then everybody looks at me as a hero. That's not his reason. If you look in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, she says, Caleb recognizes 
he needs to stand up so that the people coming after him will know that all things are possible. Even if you don't want to take the mountain of your life for your sake, <clears throat> you need to take the mountain so that your kids know it can be conquered. Oh, we have to do this when I have more time. I need you to get close and understand. Every family's got mountains. Stuff that we don't like talking about. Things that get passed down from generation to generation to generation. It's that temper that you have where you will go off like, Psh. and if I ask your wife, what's wrong with him? She'll tell me, he got it from his father. <laughs> if I look at you and I wonder why your child is just so rebellious, then I see you in board meeting. Amen, lights. <laughs> and I recognize apples don't fall far from trees. Here's the way we like to deal with the area that we've been defeated in. We like to cover it up with a bunch of good stuff. So if I'm struggling in my family life, I'm going to spend most of my time at the office because I win there. If I'm, if, if, I'm, if I'm struggling at the office, it's because I'm dedicating so much time to my family because I win there. If I got a sin issue in my life, I become overzealous at church. Lord have mercy. Want me to tell you how that plays itself out? Here's how I become overzealous. I become overzealous at pointing out other people's sins. Matter of fact, that's my office in the church. I don't have time to teach Sabbath school to the children. I, I, I don't have time to, to help collect the offering. I don't have time to do those mundane things. I'm on a higher plane. My job is to go back through, listen to the pastor's sermon, and figure out where the mistakes are. Why? Because I sound so much more holy. When I don't attach my name to the email, I just give you an Ellen White quote. And then lights. I sound so much more that when I can say, well, Ellen White said this, Ellen White said that. Period. You figure it out. When in reality, oftentimes, I want my holiness to cover up the fact that there's an area that I keep failing in. But if the church doesn't know, then I can at least look holy amongst us. Caleb announces, here is where I lost. And by God's grace, I will take this mountain. 2024, can we be a church that announces the mountains we are going to accomplish? Because God has promised God has promised. There's another way of getting your inheritance. It's, it's right there further down in the book of Joshua. 
there's another tribe that comes in line afterwards. And they're in Joshua chapter 17. Listen to this. Now, Joshua chapter 17, this is still people that are in line uh, looking at verse 14 and following. The Bible says, the people of Joseph, stop right there. We know that Joseph has got two tribes, right? It's which ones? Ephraim and Manasseh. So this is the combined, this is one-sixth of the children of Israel. The people of Joseph said to Joshua, why have you given us only one allotment and one portion for an inheritance? We are a numerous people, and the Lord has blessed us abundantly. Did you hear that? They recognize that God has blessed them. They recognize that they have prospered. They recognize that they have a packed house every Sabbath. God has blessed us abundantly. God has blessed us abundantly. But here's what they want. Listen. We want you to give us, because we're great, because God has blessed us, we want you to give us another allotment because we're so blessed. Lord have mercy. Doesn't that sound like, do you realize who we are? We are such and such. Do you understand how many delegates we have? You better hear us. Here's furthermore. This is Joshua's tribes. So they're doing politics behind the doors. Come on, Joshua. Break us off a little bit. Let's go on. Let's go on. If you are so numerous, Joshua answered, if you are so blessed, and if the hill country of the land of Ephraim is too small for you, go up into the forest and clear land for yourself. There in the lands of the Perizzites and the Raphaites. The people of Joseph replied, the hill country is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites who live in the plain have chariots with fitted, fitted with iron. Both those in Bashan and its settlements and those in the valley of Jezreel. Did you hear it? Oh, we can't do that. That would be too hard. Joshua says, yeah, you're great. God has blessed you. It's obvious. The God who blessed you, you are inhabited by the imperishable God. Go do something with it. These are folks that believe the blessing of God is my entitlement. Because I'm blessed. Because we study the Bible from cover to cover. Because we are God's chosen people, the remnant of God. We are entitled to sit and wait while God opens up the door. And people come looking to us, asking us, tell us, what must we do to be saved? And Joshua says, because you're blessed, go cut down some trees. Ask a question. When was the last time we did some tree cutting here? When was the last time we did some tree cutting here? When was the last time we looked and when somebody pointed out our faults, we said, you're absolutely right. And my brother and my sister, by God's power, I'm going to overcome this mountain. That's what God is calling us to. Because entitlement is not how God blesses. God blesses people who are like Caleb who say, I want it, I'm going to take it. Let me close. Let me close. Very end of the chapter says something really important. 
Then Joshua blessed Caleb, verse 13. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. Verse 14, so Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Canaanites, ever since. Stop, 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 stop. 13, he gets the allotment. 14, it belongs to him. In between verse 13 and 14, there is a battle that takes place. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't, you, it, God promises, and then you get it. It doesn't just, there's a battle that takes place between 13 and 14. Matter of fact, you and I live between 13, the promise that God made about our lives, and 14, the realization of the promise that God made about our lives. We live somewhere between 13 and 14. Where 13 and 14 come together, there is struggle. Where 13 and 14 come together, I'm going to have to fast. Where 13 and 14 come together, I'm going to have to look at folks and say, I'm sorry. Where 13 and 14 converge, this is where I pour out myself and say, God, if it's going to be done, you're going to have to do it. Surrender happens here so victory can happen out there between 13 and 14. This is where we live. What are you going to do between 13 and 14? I'll tell you, Caleb. Caleb got on the other side. He got to his 14. And do you know what Caleb's perspective was? He said, Having what God has in mind for me is so great in 14, I don't even mention the battle it took for me to get there. I'm not even going to talk about the battle. Why? It was unimportant. Spirit of Prophecy says, when you get to heaven and you begin to see what God saw, guess what? You will not remember the heartache that you're going through between your 13 and 14. It is worth it. Matter of fact, see, if I remember the battle between 13 and 14, when they give me that crown, I'm going to wear that. I'm going to say, yeah, you better believe I earned every dot in this crown. Let me tell you the testimony. I'm going to write a book. But do you know what's going to happen to those crowns when we get to heaven? We cast them at his feet. Why? Because the battle was not mine. It was always his. Last thing and I'll let you go. Last, last, last point and I'll let you go. Bible says the place gets renamed. It was Kerioth Arba. Why? Because the dude who took it Name was Arba. But now, it's called Hebron. Why? Because Caleb took it and renamed it. <laughs> Woo! And forever, it will remain Hebron. If you go there now, guess what it's called? Hebron. Ah, oh, my brothers and sisters, what you overcome, you get to rename. The battle that God took you through, you get to rename your trial into triumph. Who are these, Revelation says, who have this rim around their garments? Those are they that overcame. Those are they that went through much tribulation. And now the tribulation that they went through in the last days, they don't even talk about. It shows up because I got the robe. 2024. This church, we must become Caleb's. It's a mountain. Not only are you fighting, but you're fighting uphill.
but God has already changed the name of my mountain into my marvelous, miraculous event. I just got to keep stepping till I get there. Seek the Lord in prayer. Father God, in faith we cry out like Caleb. Give me this mountain in 2024. All of us, we, we know our private mountains. We know the struggles. The, the thing that, that the word says, the sins that so easily beset us. We're tired of covering them up. It doesn't do very much good. We lay out our rug and there are lumps in the rug of our righteousness. Today, Lord, give us the mountain. Make us victorious, oh God. Not by might, nor by power, but by thy spirit, saith the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.